Australia. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Uh, Welcome back to Australia. Right now, true confession. New, new album. album. So who's going to first uh, come up with their true confession? <laughs> uh, well, we spent most of the past sort of year, I suppose, preparing for it because we had a long wait for the producers to be free. So we were sort of writing our own stuff with our own band. Spent a few months writing. It's the sort of best prepared album we've done to date, and we really took our time. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <not about me. laughs> um, our relationship with Johnny and Swain is sort of really good this time, and we seem to have a really good understanding about what each other, well, what we want. <laughs> and uh, for once, they agreed. Right. So there was no big mix-ups this time. So I mean, uh, how many songs you own on it? We did. We did. Um, <coughs> 15 tracks with Jolly and Swen that we co-wrote with them and um, we sh decided that we liked nine of them. Was it ten of them? <laughs> I've, I've lost track now because we went and did another couple of tracks with um, Waterman, Stock and Etkin and they're on the album as well so even though there are two, two different sets of producers on it, it really hangs together well mm. and the songs are all better than anything we've done before I think. Now, with the American success, did that start altering your your ideas about songwriting or your approach to songwriting? Because you weren't, I mean, you're not only just working for one major market in your own place, it's, it's now... I don't think it was um, American success so much as just growing up, because, I mean, we started from sort of nothing, so when we started first sort of attempting to write our own songs, they were naive, to say the least. Mm. And um, it's just a case of growing up and learning as as we've been in the public eye which is a bit different to people who you know do a few years before they even get successful yeah. so I just think we developed in that way we haven't sort of consciously thought about changing the market although this album seems to have matured on its own I mean Venus is the only cover and it is the most poppy commercial thing on the album mm -hmm. and I mean it, obviously it's deliberately released first to attract the attention um, but I mean, there's a real mixture. There's quite a few ballads on, on this album, right. which people don't usually expect from us. And uh, it's a quite a mixed bag. <laughs> right, now let's get on to Venus. Um... We were very nervous about, um, in the last couple of years, we've been very slow to do Venus, simply because we, we got the unfair tag in the British press of being a band that did cover versions and nothing else. But we've written three albums of our yeah. own stuff now, and we've had Cruel Summer, Robert De Niro were hits everywhere. We wrote those, so you know, I think we can we can get away with it now. I mean, we just love that song. It's a ballsy little number. <laughs> and you were saying about the song, right? Yeah, we yes. met him in um, Holland the other weeks, and apparently he retired after he'd made that song because he made so much money. I don't know if it was a hit in America. We were mm. sort of discussing. We didn't know whether it was, but I'm sure it must have been. For him to, to retire. That much, yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. just he's just come back into the business again, so it didn't last forever. He's got another band together. Well, I mean, like, um, there's, I mean, I find it rather confusing whether Tom Jones recorded this first or whether it was Shocking Blue. We've never heard the Tom Jones. Well, recording. he was actually you know, in the band did. Shocking Blue, so I would imagine if he must wrote the Shocking song, Blue, he yeah. must have yeah. done it first. I'd like to hear old Tom's version. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Tom's one, one of our, our favourites. <laughs> <laughs> We've often wanted to cover a Tom song. So I mean, like, we, I mean. Did you all like Venus? Uh, it was something that you performed before? Or? Yeah, we, um, when we first started off about four years ago, it was that and really saying something that we used to rehearse with our band. And uh, we didn't want to be known as a cover version band, so we only did really saying something for the first album. Which um, we're not exactly mad about. It looks like we're sort of joining in, mm -hmm. even though we decided to do this before. But it's obviously a sign that, you know, people do want that sort of thing. I think it takes everyone back and to the people who know the songs and then I mean if you pick a great song you know you can't really go wrong well I, I mean it even happens down in Australia where you're having a, a night at like even a dance place yeah. isn't that, where they may have a 70s disco yeah. night and you don't really realize until you go to a, like a place where they're having say a 70s disco night of how many actually good dance disco records oh, there yeah. were that mm -hmm. weren't they were actually pre-synthesized time oh, yeah. yeah exactly um, That's what we grew up with. And, I mean, then, and, then, and then on their same token, they have 60s nights uh, where you, you've got that 60s music coming I mean, through. they do loads of it. Here's, I mean, I think probably our favourite records, like the Vaughan, like our friends play who are DJs, are um, a sort of mixture of 60s and 70s, like yeah. soul and disco music. 
And they just seem by far the best ones to dance to. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that's always intrigued me, um, especially with the UK market, and I've brought up in many interviews over the years, of where, like for instance, Tamla Motown has always been very, very big here. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's And remained big here, you yeah. know. And to hear sort of like Diana Ross doing Chain Reaction, even though it was written by Barry Gibb, it's almost like as if Barry looked at Holland Dozier Holland of the yeah. Terrible Motown time and thought, right, I'll write that sort of song to fit yeah. Diana Ross. Because mm -hmm. you could almost think that it was a, like a supreme song. Right? It works very well for her, though, because, I mean, she had been struggling in the last few years, and that was a huge hit here mm -hmm. for her. So I that's they, what people love in this country. They just love that beat, you know. But she also did that, this sort of spoof in the video of going back yeah. to the 60s, and yeah. how she looked. So it was obviously, you know, she was making no bones about the fact that it was like that sort of record. Right now, as far as um, you were saying about ballads before, have you been hesitant perhaps to do like a set of ballads and, and putting them into your album because people wanted perhaps up things? We can. Um, we never can release ballads because we've tried that before with um, Cheers then, yeah. and it was like a flop for us because the public unfortunately do see us as just a pop band and don't want anything slow or serious. They just want bright, poppy music. So hopefully, if we get like two dance floor hits maybe we can release a ballad after then because it's a real shame i mean our favorite song on the album is trick of the night which is a ballad so. it's just i mean it would be a, a real shame we feel if people don't see that other side to us which means we need to get a couple of up tempo ones to grab their attention and sort of try and sell the album off that and, and hope they sort of like the rest of it right. i mean with a bit of luck i think i think maybe in america we've probably got more of a chance of releasing Trick of the Night and it being a hit than here because I think they're they're more ready to accept what you give you know I mean accept you as you are and accept the record on its merits as opposed to here where they tend to love putting you in a little box and saying well they're a pop band and they're mm. heavy mm. metal or whatever you know it's harder to cross over in in England I don't know about Australia well, yeah, well I mean well in some respects yes it is you know yeah. um, if, if you take um, Cruel Summer and I, I, you know, I've asked you this before when it was starting to break big in America. Did it really come as a surprise to you that... that well, when we recorded Cruel Summer, we thought it was just the best thing we'd ever done. It was absolutely guaranteed to go to number one all over the world because it was brilliant. And it got to number eight in this country, and we were very disappointed that it got to eight in this country. And at the time, it was at the peak of the, the, the media backlash against us, which I think we've weathered nicely now. We're coming out of. I like to think there's light at the end of the tunnel. But um, when it started to really do well, and it was huge in France and, and really big on the continent, and, and then huge in America a year after we released it here, it was like, haha, told you so. We did no promotion for it. We, yeah, no we never went there. there. Or anything. It, it just sort of happened. Well, I mean, even in retrospect with Rob De Niro, I mean, like, I think that. Um, when you talk about media backlash, I think that people sort of saw this song, great song, a hit, and three girls performing, which again we've, we've gone over old ground with other interviews. But I think that they were thinking this is three dancers that are just yeah. doing a song, or yeah. I mean, nothing, not insulting Samantha Fox, but like a model doing a song. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. I um, mean, that's that's the one thing that always worries us is, is that people um, might perceive us that way, particularly in. I think it was a rude awakening for them when they realised after a while that it wasn't that. I'm yeah. sure a lot of people don't even still realise, particularly in Europe where there, there's actually, which we realised only quite recently, there's so many sort of three girl groups in Europe and they all work in a similar format to us, but I mean I don't know definitely, but they seem like they're either ex-models, ex-dancers by the way they look and the way they mm. dress and, and the sort of songs they sing, you know, that doesn't seem like they've written them because they're not sort of personal to them. And it really upsets us that people might sort of see us in, on t TV in Europe and sort of think, oh, yeah. well, they're just another of those sort of ex-dance. Mind you, how they could think we're ex-dance. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think our records are so totally different to those. And um, we've got a real stamp of individuality that um, makes us, you know, stand out from, from all that type of group. Will we write our own songs? Yeah, 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 it's going to be uh, probably the one that we wrote with Waterman and Stuff Nate King, which is called More Than Physical, because that's a really dance record as well, mm. and we have to do that so that we can then release the ballad that we right. desperately mm. want yeah, to do. Yeah, hopefully we can put out Trick of the Night, which everyone seems to agree is, 
is the best song on the album, but everyone's really worried about putting it out too soon and wasting it, you know. So we've sort of got to build it up over the next couple of months. Well, congratulations on the, on, on the album and the single. Thanks. And it's going to be a big one down in Australia, so it looks like you'll be heading back there at least for some sun sometime. <laughs> well, let's hope it's sunny this time. <laughs> well, at least it's sunny here. I know, it makes First a change. Day. First Everybody's day, actually. Shop, I think. This, this made me feel ill. I was quite ill this morning with it. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, thank you.